triggered. It's, it's like, like triggered, triggered is a very the term itself is a is is a very victimized term, right? I mean, it's like you triggered me with this. I have a feeling you caused it. You need to go. You're the bad person. You made me feel this way. But that's not the way we grew up. I think. Yeah, the solution is I have to figure out who's behind this shit. What, are you going to figure it out by yourself? You can't... No. Can you not so, yes, <laughs> Before you took me home, I wanted to give you a hug. Well, I wanted a hug. The time is 5.59 p.m. Going to meet you. And um, my goal is going to be to tell her that we should not associate or associate as much. Anyway, that's that. My hips are shot, my knees are shot. Yeah, but you're still pretty good in bed, right? Are you? Oh God, please tell me you're not. You are? Mm -hmm. Terrible. Fuck, you're old, man. You're old. Mm -hmm. You're old. I told you. You don't, you don't know how to move or anything? Nope. Fuck, how good are you, man? I can take you home now. No, I'm just joking. I mean, in bed, like, if your <laughs> hips are shot and your legs are shot, how do you move in bed? Well, I'm by myself. Okay. I think you need to get back out there in the real world. I am in the real world. No, I mean, in the sex life world. Oh, yeah, because that's really that important. I think you're missing out in life. <clears throat> yeah. I think that's what makes making you so low. I'm just so, trying to help you, man. So how are we talking? How, you weren't talking about your, mas your masseuse. It was a really talking. good massage, I was telling you. Yeah, so let's... Well, how do we get from that to talking about me in bed? <laughs> well, you should call this guy up anyway. And then you can get... get you can get out of your system. I don't need to get out of my system. I think you need to get out of your system. <laughs> Really good song. Why are your cops there? I don't know. Fuck. Fuck, why are your cops there just sitting there? Oh my fucking god. I'm scared. Is it bad to sit a loiter around the parking lot? Oh my god, you know what? Fuck it, whatever. You know what? We're not doing anything bad. Nothing's going on.
Well, no wonder I'm not getting a fucking job. Oh, I don't know it doesn't help me. Well, dude, I, just, I don't want... I just... The stuff with the police really scared the crap out of me. That's not true. I didn't say that. Okay, well, let me call your lawyer tomorrow. Do you get it now? And what? This whole program needs to get shut down. This is bullshit. This is so... I'm so sick of this. Like, I have been what? dealing with this program for a year and a half, and I've seen what happened to members, I've seen what happened to staff. And there's all well, behind the scene crap that no one knows about. See what? I need to get the hell out of here. Well, that's a choice that you have to make. It's not my fight. Yeah, it is. I'm mad at you. I really want to play to fuck you. Good. Mm -hmm. So I'll say it. Because you're running away now. I'm not running away. Yeah, you are. No. Yeah, it's you're called. Leaving. You're leaving members behind. It's called self-preservation. Yeah, whatever. Don't well, get mad at me. It's okay. Okay, this is really, really, really involved. Oh, yes. Wow. This would take a long time to get through oh. this. Um, this is a major project. <laughs> and well, I shouldn't say everybody. Everyone who has what's in your hand realizes like oh damn you're done especially something like this something along these lines well Hello, it's April 2023. And the topic of this video has completely changed from my original plans, a topic I've struggled with for almost a year to do. Perhaps this will be another scheduled video for the future. Brief of my professional and personal bios, my story, and some topics I've discussed. The overlays either support or connect the dots as they usually do. I, I, I testified to was how you can't actually drive a car legally. I mean, it would be impossible. No one can get this car from here to the end of the street completely legally. So no one's going to arrest you. Thank you.
A brief on my life from a professional perspective. In my early adulthood, I had several psych evaluations and vulnerable sector police clearances. I worked in corrections, but not as a CO, more with the psychology department while having two businesses and a government job at the same time. I was also a martial arts instructor, fitness instructor, and fought freestyle fighting with other types of specialized training. I supply taught public schools as a supply teacher to practicing law as agent where I had a placement and offers prosecuting, revolutionizing the debt recovery world using litigation, having the status of a peace officer while process serving, and I did briefly walk with the elites of the world and met world leaders and learned things most deemed as conspiracies. After all this, I went to work in the mental health industry, which shares the last part of my story. My primary focus on my video efforts has been whistleblowing and exposing first-hand knowledge related to my personal and professional experiences. This includes sex trafficking, police, judicial, and political corruption, offering insight most people do not have. Did you know that judges have lawyers who work for them? And although a judge, in theory, may not, for example, be allowed to learn about a case in any kind of media, their lawyer can? How about there being two sets of criminal codes that appear identical? but one is used for authority types, while the other, the commoner. Setting aside political interferences and personal agendas. A brief on my life from a personal perspective. I have shared my connection with the Most High, also known as God, with a capital G. I survived being killed in my mother's womb when an estranged family member tried to kill me by pushing my mother down some stairs. My uncle on my father's side saved us both. I was born dead for 45 minutes after surviving abortion, before any possibility of having any belief system influence, I will repeat this, before the possibility of having any belief system influence. I stress this because this is the basis of my relationship with the Most High. I died by drowning around 5 and 12 years of age with little exposure to any belief system. A woo-woo event took place March 22, 1998, which would parallel my experience during the second drowning when I was around 12 years old. These would be known as my death experiences, which differ to my near-death experiences, such as being beaten and left for dead by a gang beating in junior high, being deliberately poisoned for an insurance trust fund that would later be stolen from me sometime after I moved out on my own, just after I turned 17 years old. Aside from these examples, other somewhat related examples, some may say as miracle examples, is when I had ear infections so bad, doctors said I would never hear again. I was born disabled and should have never walked. Scarlet fever, double pneumonia, and bronchitis, I've had these things. One time, I exited a vehicle at the last second that soon after was in an accident that would have killed me, and the list goes on. Although my family comes from Central and Eastern Europe, and I was born in Canada, it appears my bloodline traces back to ancient Sumer, and I've showed evidence of this in a few older videos. The meaning of my first name, Anthony, means praiseworthy, while my last name, Meriden, means warrior for truth and justice. I also have a lifetime of woo-woo events, which differ to what some may call spiritual events. My, as a descriptive, earthly paths in life have given me first-hand knowledge and perspectives most do not have. There is so much complexity with what I've been through, it is difficult to remember every detail, so I will go over the highlights, also to keep this as short as possible. Everything is supported with a plethora of independent evidence, which I share examples of in other videos and downloadable PDFs. Here is my story. April 20, 2012, I move across the country to start a new life. The first job I was able to get was cleaning public toilets until I got a position in my new career in June 2012. The executive director at the time, Dr. R, and I just finished a meeting and he had plans for me to move up in the organization, to move up to higher positions. As we were leaving his office and I was standing in the doorway, a female, the same one that would become central to my story, was walking through the front door and proceeded to go straight ahead. Dr. R smiled and said to me, you can have sex with her if you want. I was shocked to hear this. I told him I did not want to have sex with anyone and explained the history with the woman that I married. I have affidavits from back then supporting this. A few weeks later, Alberta Health Services came to interview everyone separately. During all this time, the organization was in the news about other unrelated issues 
with the organization. Alberta Health Services asked me some what I thought were peculiar questions about if I knew what was going on there. I said I'm new and didn't know much, but expanded to say there were some things that needed to be looked into. A few weeks after this, Dr. R resigned his position and moved on. A few months later, a new executive director was appointed, and this is where things become messy. I do not know if the following is connected to what I just said or the following or not. I don't have enough information to make a properly informed conclusion. November 2012, I resigned from the mental health organization I was employed with, my last day being December 31st, 2012. I have videos showing my original resignation letter, the extension of my resignation letter, and my final resignation letter. This was based on relations between the new executive director and me. I learned about real sexual abuse, trafficking, whatever you want to call it, by influential men in the city. My plan was to return to my province of origin sometime in June 2013. December 2012. A female attendee, the same one that was walking through the door I had mentioned earlier, accused me and a male co-worker of some sort of sexual assault. I do not know anything more. Police records show that she has an extensive history of doing this to men. No one wanted to speak to me. I tried to address my concern. I never saw this coming. I made the first audio recording of her in December of 2012 and I've shared this in many videos. January 2013 to May 2013, I had the opportunity to meet with the female always in public, recorded the conversations to one, vindicate myself, and two, to gather as much evidence as I could with, with regards to the sexual abuse, trafficking, whatever it is that you want to call it, and I got what I needed. But before I could figure out what to do with this evidence, the following event took place. May 4, 2013, two males known as police officers at the time, Mr. K and Mr. H, decided to do street justice on behalf of the female. They were clear about this. Mr. K sucker punched me through the driver's window, knocking me out. Mr. H put a gun to my head. Mr. K handcuffed me, and they beat me. Mr. H testified it was a taser, not a gun, but the police logs show that he signed out no taser that evening. They also testified they found the recorder in my pocket on recording at that time but as you will hear later it was completely erased mr h being a christian denied finding intestinal gas pills on me and lied about many other things after swearing on the bible most of the beating took place after they found the pills in my pocket mr h showed mr k mr k saying to me we got here just in time you sick fuck you know what you're about to do to her as mr k loosened and tightened the handcuffs more on this later on the female witnessing all this and their threats to her scared her she changed her story and this is very important to listen to she changed her story from her not being an alleged victim in december of 2012 but her hearing rumors that it was someone else this is key the next day, I was arrested and charged with alleged obstruction, alleged resisting arrest, and allegedly assaulting a police officer. Nothing else. I went to the hospital for my injuries, which have left me partly disabled for life. It took doctors six months to get any images due to swelling of the most damaged areas. I'm going to highlight this before I forget. The resisting arrest part later disappeared, and I didn't even know. Now. When I was released from the hospital, I visited the female at the hospital she was at. And yes, I have audio recordings that I've shared in videos of my meeting her at that time. June 2013, the two former officers pressure her. She filed a restraining order against me after she said she would testify on my behalf. I have audio recordings of her saying this, which I've shared in videos. She also filed a complaint against the police after she was released from a different hospital that she was at because after i met her originally at the original hospital she was at they relocated her i managed to get my vehicle out of the impound and sometime soon after it was stolen august 2013 the sex crimes unit clears me again my property that was taken by the two former officers was apparently released to me on june 2013 but the two alleged they lost the paperwork 
Thus, it was re-released again towards the end of August 2013. My personal property was in a big, heavy plastic see-through bag from the police station. I opened it in front of my first lawyer, and he panicked when the audio recorder was still inside. The same audio recorder that was recording my conversations with the female prior to the two former officers and the event with them. He grabbed it out of my hand. My right hand was still in a brace and wanted to examine it himself. He wasn't happy that there might be some evidence to help me. It was erased and I was missing much paperwork that was inside the backpack. November 2013, the trial begins with Mr. K's testimony and the first lawyer. Mr. K complicates the trial with a false narrative about the female to justify the charges to discredit me. Mr. K admits to coming to the location 45 minutes prior to the reports. The prosecutor realizes he's lying, the trial adjourned, and I refuse a plea deal. The transcript is missing the entire redirect which incriminates Mr. K and Mr. H. Mr. K testified. They did what they did to me so I wouldn't do that to anyone else, implying whatever was alleged by or about the female, which challenges their allegation of my why I assaulted them and so forth. I want to highlight later independent evidence from other sources confirms the transcripts are missing a lot. The trial judge even reserved the right to make changes to the trial transcripts. December 2013, my father passed away and the reason behind this has a story of its own. Long story short, I could not be with him in the hospice where I left him in my province of origin due to legal matters. And furthermore, during sentencing, despite the evidence of my father's passing, the trial judge, the so-called trial judge, was disrespectful when he said that there's no evidence that I suffered because there's no evidence my father passed away. Sometime in 2014, I terminated my first lawyer and retained my second lawyer. This appeared to have angered the trial judge for some reason. I terminated the first lawyer because he said I wasn't going to get a fair trial, that I would get the representation that I paid for, which was minimal to nothing, and he withheld evidence when the trial began. My evidence. He withheld that. The Crown Prosecutor asked for an adjournment and begins to suggest that the defense, me, could file a Section 11b charter argument to be tried within a reasonable time because of his adjournment. My second lawyer made it clear I did not want to, as I told him prior that because Mr. K had fabricated his testimony and brought the female to the trial, I had to defend that. Several months after I terminated my first lawyer, he emailed me saying, I'm going to paraphrase this, the female falsely accused me because she was angry with me. I assumed because I initially did not want to be personally involved with helping her and others with the sexual abuse, trafficking, whatever it is, after I initially told Alberta Health Services in August of 2012 what I did know at that time. I did advise her and others what they needed to do and they needed to do it themselves. February 2015, trial resumes with second lawyer. Mr. H testifies, Mr. K testifies again. Now they allegedly thought there was prostitution and I hurt Mr. K's feelings, which is also known as disrespecting him or disrespecting an officer. They testified I was not verbally abusive. I was not aggressive. I was not fighting them. I was cooperative. They had no injuries. The alleged bylaw stop was a pretext with the first officer, Mr. K, admitting to making mistakes, how he almost shot me dead, and Mr. K having memory issues, etc. I refused another plea deal and originally refused to accept the Section 11B charter argument to be tried within a reasonable time, which was 18 months. Sometime after this, Mr. K is no longer a police officer and he is a salesperson now. May 2015, I filed a lawsuit a few days before the limitation period was to expire, which was a few weeks prior to my testifying the first time. The senior counsel for the City of Calgary, Mr. M, threatens my second lawyer, which I witnessed and have evidence of. The lawsuit was stayed. It was around this time in 2015 I spent six figures 
almost six figures, on fighting for truth and justice. I ended up testifying for the first time, and this is when the Crown Prosecutor told the trial judge I was suing the police and the city. A good friend of the trial judge told me the trial judge had no criminal law experience when practicing law and sat on a committee with ties to the Calgary police. Go figure. December 2015, I take over my trial despite my post-traumatic stress and depression issues and use all legal means to hold my second lawyer accountable successfully. I learned the prosecutor and the first two lawyers made a deal not to give my independent evidence about the female, vindicating myself and proving whatever is going on there. I introduced my evidence that was being withheld. The issue surrounding the female is no longer an issue with the second void year. The false narrative about the female is going to be used to support the false accusations by the two former officers. My second lawyer told me the trial judge would try to prevent me from self-representing and may try to use an allegation that I am mentally unfit. This being after Mr. M, with the case management judge for the lawsuit, told the judge not to treat me as a layperson and that I am more than mentally capable to represent myself due to practicing law as agent, a conflict, a contradiction between the two courts. Anyway, I addressed this in my filed materials before the criminal court saying this other court has deemed me mentally capable. April 2016, I give closing summations only using the officer's testimonies to make my case. I have a video showing the full transcript of this. July 2016, I am convicted of both charges of allegedly assaulting a police officer and alleged obstruction based on allegedly disrespecting an officer. Prosecutor now seeks jail time for the first time, and this is important. I immediately filed my Queen's Bench appeal materials, including the Section 11B Charter argument to be tried within a reasonable time. At first I was going to use R versus Askoff 1990, but relied on R versus Jordan 2016. The trial judge cast doubt on convicting me three times. I'm going to repeat myself. The trial judge cast doubt on convicting me three times in his conviction. I have videos showing this, such as, but not limited to, quote, if I am wrong in finding Mr. Meriden assaulting a police officer. The walls are to the point where Anybody can be locked up pretty much for any time. Like, so who would you arrest for what? It seems like you were saying you were saying that. But That's the thing you're not understanding. So like they were in the street. That's, That's enough. enough. That's enough. Yeah. We're setting the stage and then you're like, oh my gosh, look at this stage. Well, yeah, we created it. November 2016, Section 11B charter argument proceeds to be tried within a reasonable time before the criminal court. Now the prosecutor prior to entering the courtroom briefly told me outside the courtroom that this has to go away today, that day. And he had some sort of sympathy for me. Now in front of the court the prosecutor agreed that the trial exceeded the time. Keep in mind 49 months my trial lasted. We only disagreed on how much longer it exceeded the time. The trial judge dismissed both of us and dismissed my charter argument. December 2016, I am sentenced. I decline to make arguments for leniency. Judge threatens me with two years less a day if I don't apologize. I refuse to apologize knowing if I don't, I will go to jail. I did say to the judge that I'm sorry what happened to me I went on about the injustice. The trial judge states 90 days. This was later changed to 60 days. The trial judge published my conviction as case law, found by law students writing papers saying I should have been put away for life. A former friend of the judge, and I'm going to repeat this again, told me that the trial judge had next to no criminal law experience and sat on a committee as a lawyer that had ties to the Calgary police. June 2017, I returned to my province 
of origin in February 2017, thinking my appeal would be successful. I had to leave due to being harassed by police and unknown persons. I have videos, photos, and audios of the said. A new judge takes over the Queen's Bench appeal case at the last minute. We already had a previous judge seized who was on my side. This is why I had to wait many months for this next available date. This new judge for the Queen's Bench appeal mentioned excessive time by the criminal court, but didn't rule on it. The Queen's Bench appeal dismissed with a third lawyer. I had filed my own Queen's Bench materials. No way that this could have been messed up, but it was. Third lawyer took herself off record and said she wants nothing to do with the case. I returned to Calgary, Alberta, crossing the country, and filed my Court of Appeal materials, again including the Section 11b Charter Argument. February 2018. Internal Affairs conclude their investigation. New evidence is given supporting my position of innocence of all accusations and convictions. I have a few videos showing this. August 2018. Court of Appeal dismissed granting leave with the fourth lawyer and he took himself off record not wanting anything to do with my case. It should be noted, the fifth Crown Prosecutor of my case told the Court of Appeal for Alberta if my matter went to the Supreme Court of Canada, they would not represent. There was no opportunity to bring up how the fourth lawyer and the fifth Crown Prosecutor found evidence that the trial transcripts were, in fact, tampered with, or the Section 11b Charter Argument, etc. I show this in other videos. Both the third and fourth lawyer did not include the Section 11b Charter Argument in their verbal arguments, despite it being in both my filed materials. Technically, this is still before the courts, but not ruled on. The fourth lawyer stated, if I didn't do what I did with the female, there would have been no help for me. I decided not to pursue the Supreme Court and reopen the civil proceedings. October 2019, I left the stay of the lawsuit and proceeded with the case management judge. It was during this time I told the case management judge I was successful with legal remedies against my second lawyer based on my second lawyer withholding evidence during the criminal matter after Mr. M threatened him. After the judge asked for clarification by me, he made it clear to Mr. M he was not pleased with him. January 2019, the Supreme Court sends me a letter and I attempt to pursue it. Mr. M pressures me to release information about the Supreme Court appeal. I refuse and he threatened me with contempt, the most ridiculous thing you can do to, to intimidate. I held firm not to release anything and told the court management judge of this. After many months, only problem the Supreme Court could not hear my case is because there were no rulings on the lower appeal courts on the Section 11b Charter or anything else, meaning I would have to bring it back to the courts in the city of Calgary and have them admit they erred. This would have been a useless endeavor to pursue. January 2019 and onward, we began the discovery of the lawsuit. The senior counsel for the city of Calgary, Mr. M, refuses Mr. K and Mr. H to answer most of my questions, and he himself gives answers to most of the other questions that were answered, while Mr. K and Mr. H are under oath. Both Mr. K and Mr. H denied finding the intestinal gas pills, which caused them to assume I was going to drug her for some reason. Discrepancies with their denials as follows. They told her that evening I was going to drug her with the intestinal gas pills they found, and this is supported by audio recordings after the May 4, 2013 event. The police filed affidavits stating the police had a lawful obligation to warn her of the pills, still denying in court they found intestinal gas pills on me which caused them to tighten the handcuffs as they do with actual pedophiles and sex offenders and beat me causing my permanent injuries, which is supported by the police profiling me by 9 a.m. the next morning as someone who mimics a pedophile grooming a child to obtain warrants when there were no underage children involved. This was a massive discrediting campaign against me which could explain why they took the text messages out of context, them telling me they want to find something sexual to charge me with, them saying what kind of sick fuck gets investigated for such things, etc. None of that made any sense, or does it make sense to me now? This is supported by her telling me she was sorry for what happened, as everything was her fault. Audio recorded, in videos, 
And this is supported by her changing her story from her being the alleged victim to rumors of it being someone else, which is supported by her telling me the second executive director told her he needs to clean up her mess. Mr. M, the two former officers, were being disrespectful to me so much to the point I had to stop questioning during the discovery. The disrespect of Mr. H was noted by my second lawyer when he was speaking to the criminal trial judge as well. This is in the trial transcripts. My second lawyer stated Mr. K was on the defensive and not answering simple questions directly. Also in the trial transcripts. During my being examined during discovery, Mr. M, the former senior counselor of the city of Calgary, who threatened my second lawyer, admitted, I want to be very clear on this, admitted I was innocent and wrongfully convicted. And yes, there was a court reporter recording that and typed it all out. He admitted it on record. Further saying, it doesn't matter. I was still convicted and he smiled. This was recorded by a clerk of the court. Mr. M also attempted to hold me in contempt for not answering several questions, dismissing I was self-representing and I had grounds for objection. Now on a side note, transcripts were tampered with and I have four versions of transcripts. I have four versions of disclosure packages. Threats to my second lawyer, not denied. Lawsuit being mentioned at the criminal trial. The ignoring of my Section 11B charter argument being convicted despite the evidence contrary to any guilt. October 2019, most of my lawsuit was struck. Much of it was based on my being convicted. This is why they needed me convicted of allegedly assaulting a police officer and alleged obstruction because it was their defense for the lawsuit. This only left one element to my lawsuit, an impossible element standing alone. Costs were awarded against me to be paid forthwith, meaning if I did not pay, I could be in contempt and up to 40 days in jail each time until paid in full. Mr. M asked for double costs, which I was prepared for as that's what I would have done. The case management judge was extremely angered at Mr. M for his interfering with the proceedings, both criminal and civil, and told him no. I have an emotional breakdown in court. By the next day, I offer to withdraw my lawsuit. I sought help from pro bono lawyers. After two months, they told me they could not help me due to, and I'm going to quote them, pushback. December 24, 2019, the judge signs the consent order that my lawsuit is withdrawn and I don't have to pay the balance of the costs. It's all over. This is how I was forced to withdraw my lawsuit. As if I didn't pay, I could have faced more jail time with no hope of success with the lawsuit. January 2020 and onward, I've been living in the aftermath of the plethora of injustice, partly disabled, and not being able to obtain employment reflecting my education and career history with my health declining while dealing with what we've all been dealing with, worldwide events and the world shutting down. You hear the past stories and you see when a cop does something wrong, you see the unions and you see the politicians stand up for the officer. You don't see anyone stand up for, for the, the citizen. They just become a statistic, a number that you're going after. That's what you do in policing. You're trying to do what keeps you out of trouble from all the problems that are internal. Like, I never feared the streets, but I constantly feared other officers. They fear is that we can get away with whatever we choose to get away with. The laws are to the point where anybody can be locked up pretty much for any time. Like one of the cases I did uh, in, in uh, the Senate in Maryland that I, I testified to was how you can't actually drive a car legally. I mean, it would be impossible. No one can get this car from here to the end of the street completely legally. So, officer can arrest you. And that's our standard in policing, is fear. 
So if you are afraid, you can do whatever you want. That's the legal standard. So if I am afraid that you can take my life, then I'm allowed to take yours legally. Where does the fear come from? Like in the, in the guys that do have the fear, it sounds like you think that a lot of them, or most of them do. Where was it? I'm not afraid to say it. They were the people that were afraid before they came in. And just because you got a badge and a gun doesn't suddenly mean you're not afraid. Some samples of things I've discussed over the years, in no particular order. Police, judicial and political corruption and how they will lie, cheat and steal for their benefit. CPIC, police computer databases being broken and misused. My sexual assault complaints, which I pursued for almost a decade off and on, being interpreted on CPIC as I was the one being complained about. How feminism is a weapon when false allegations of sexual assault are used to destroy people, as with the attempt with my story in December of 2012. Alleged profiling such as my mimicking a pedophile grooming a child to destroy my reputation when I was secretly recording evidence from the female regarding my vindication as well as the sexual abuse trafficking of these vulnerable women at the organization. How no matter where I sit in public, minding my own business, busybodies or glorified busybodies cause trouble. Such as when I was sitting in the park facing a street and the soccer moms behind me didn't want me there. Or when I was sitting at a Tim Hortons late one night and Brinks approached me asking, what am I doing there? Setting aside the backstory of the May 4th, 2013 event, sitting my own business when two thugs changed everyone's lives forever and destroyed mine. Not to mention when going about one's business trying to be happy during stressful times and some sociopath, psychopath with an ego targets you and decides to impose hardship rather than help. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. I think a lot of them are just stone cold. You know, there's no emotion and they don't view people as people anymore. And you almost feel like you're literally living in the twilight zone. And you feel like you're the only sane one in a bunch of insane people. And it's up to the point where I'm afraid that I'm going to start thinking that this is normal. <laughs> I don't want to ever get to that point. Listen to this and write it down if you can't remember it. You're never going to outgrow warfare. You simply must learn to fight. I hear people saying to me all the time, when is it going to get easier? When you die.